Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Daniel Robinson and I'm the academic lead for the Pacific for, for the UNSW Institute for Global Development. Um, it's my pleasure today to continue running this um, Pacific seminar series and to have Associate Professor Susanna Vazneri here today um, talking about optimising strategies for control and elimination of neglected tropical diseases. Um, I'll just let everyone know that we're recording. Um, so th this will be recorded and then posted on the IGD website. Um, first, I'll just do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the um, Bidigal people um, as the traditional custodians of land of UNSW main campus um, in Kensington and Randwick. Um, pay my respects to elders um, past and present and to indigenous people um, in the current and emerging generations and any um, uh, Indigenous people who might be joining us here today as well. Um, thank you also to the participants um, from the Pacific region for joining us here today too. Um, and I'm calling from Darawal country. Now I'd like to um, introduce um, Associate Professor Susanna Vazneri. Uh, so she has a multidisciplinary background, combining degrees and experience in biochemistry, neurosciences, health policy and international development uh, and field epidemiology in tropical diseases. Following undergraduate studies in Portugal, Susanna undertook a PhD in neuroscience at NYU Medical School in New York and began her career on tropical diseases as a malaria molecular parasitologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, with an EMBL fellowship. While based in London, she did malaria research in top African research centres in Kenya, the Gambia and Tanzania. Um, she's also worked in the Malaria Consortium in Mozambique as a monitoring and evaluation specialist, um, and then moved to Angola as the scientific coordinator of a recently created health, science, health research centre, where she led a team of approximately 70 scientific and research staff. Um, she joined the Kirby Institute at UNSW in 2018, where she leads the Neglected Tropical Diseases Research Group that uses intervention studies to generate evidence that can inform health policy changes for more effective and sustainable disease control strategies. So thank you very much, Susanna. Um, that was a bit of a long introduction. Um, it's good to have you here today. Um, and I will hand over, if we can stop sharing that slide. Um, and hand over and you can put your slides up. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me and the opportunity to talk about um, the, re sorry, just the, the research that we are um, currently conducting uh, in the NTD research group. Can you see my slides now? Sure. A bit of a... Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so um, I want to start by saying that um, I will be presenting the work um, of my team, and that includes uh, present uh, postdocs, um, as well as former, former staff, as well as the work of PhD students and, and the master's student, and also the contribution of the global health team leader, John, Professor John Calder. And obviously none of the work that we'll be talking about will be possible without a strong in-country, without strong in-country collaborations. And I'll mention our, uh, some of our collaborators as, as I go along, um, as I talk about the research in those countries. So first an introduction about these neglected tropical diseases. You may know they are a group, a large group of, of infectious diseases uh, caused by protozoa, bacteria, virus, fungi, and parasites. Um, they affect um, the world's uh, poorest community. Um, entities impair, entities for short, of neglected tropical diseases impair physical and cognitive development in children. And, and lead to adults with, with lower producti productivity, uh, therefore perpetuating the poverty cycle. Their names so or neglected tropical diseases also reflect the fact that historically they have received little or funding uh, and attention. I will be mentioning these diseases that appear uh, here in, in golden bold, uh, and they have the, uh, in common the fact um, that the most kind of uh, prominent public health 
uh, control measure is called preventive chemotherapy, also called mass drug administration if it's given to entire communities or MDA in short. And that consists of um, regular periodic administration of medications to groups at risk without prior diagnosis. And that aims to control morbidity and in some cases also eliminate transmission. So one group of parasitic diseases I'll be talking about are these salt transmitted helminths or STH for short. There's five species um, that are common. They are the most common um, entity actually, and they are transmitted through the ingestion of contaminated feces or skin penetration. Um, infections uh, lead to growth delays in anemia and preventive chemotherapy uh, with albendazole or mebendazole targeting school aid children are, are the main uh, uh, WHO recommended approach to eliminate morbidity. I will we'll also be mentioning scabies, which is a skin entity caused by this mite. Um, it leads to it itching and, and, and rashes and can only cause and can also cause uh, secondary bacterial infections known as impetigo. Um, in terms of control strategies, strategies. Uh, recent trials uh, led by Lucia Romani, while a PhD student with uh, Andrew, Professor Andrew Steer at MCRI, um, Lucia is now a postdoc with, with us, uh, show that ivermectin MDA uh, is more effective than the current um, standard treatment, which um, is basically identifying uh, people infect, infested with scabies and, and providing topical permethrin to them and their um, contacts. I will also be mentioning another parasitic entity, uh, schistosomiasis, that is mainly caused by this, um, one of these three species of, of schistosoma. Um, it's uh, transmitted through uh, skin penetration and it includes a snail host. It also leads to uh, malnutrition, anemia, uh, among other uh, more severe uh, morbidity. And its control, again, with, with, is with preventive chemotherapy with Prezinquantel. I'll be mentioning trachoma. Uh, this is a, a, um, an entity caused by these bacteria, Chlamydia trachomatis, that also uh, can cause, um, is also a sexually transmitted infection, uh, but this strain infects the eye. Uh, it's transmitted through little flies um, and uh, continuing infection leads to, to um, inflammation uh, of the eye uh, followed by scarring and uh, blindness. Again, one of the main control strategies is MDA with azithromycin. Uh, I will also be talking about this other skin NTD caused by a bacteria, Treponema pertenu, uh, that is very similar to the bacteria that causes syphilis, but in this case, uh, it infects um, the skin and leads to lesions and, and chronic disfigurement, as you can see here. Uh, preventive chemotherapy, so MDA with azithromycin actually aims to achieve eradication, that is global elimination of, of this disease. I'll be also finally mentioning very briefly lymphatic filariasis, that is another parasitic uh, entity caused this by one of these uh, three species of, of parasites that are transmitted through uh, mosquitoes, and it's also known as elephantiasis, so it causes um, severe abnormal enlargement of, of limbs or, or genitals uh, leading to pain and, and severe disability. And again, uh, control strategy is through MDA uh, with multiple drugs, uh, usually DC, albendazole, and sometimes also a combination with a, a, an addition of, of ivermectin. Okay, so uh, the research uh, in our NTD research group basically um, aims to generate evidence to improve current strategies for control of NTD. So these are diseases that we are focusing on. There's uh, several control measures. As I said, I'll be focusing on, on this preventive chemotherapy. And um, I will be uh, presenting or showcasing uh, studies um, that um, kind of are epidemiological studies, either intervention trials or impact assessments of, of MDA programs in endemic countries. 
We also have some research on, on diagnostics, so trying to improve diagnostic techniques for um, those uh, NTDs. And we are also starting to do some social science research, so looking at acceptability and health systems feasibility, as well as, as uh, health economics and mathematical modeling. So this is just a, a layout of, of the presentation. So I'll first touch on, on um, a couple of, of uh, um, randomized controlled trials that aim to optimize strategies for sustainable control of salt transmitted helmets. Uh, and those are studies in Vietnam and Solomon Islands. Then I'll talk about um, intervention studies on integrated control of NTDs and that's assessing the impact of different drug combinations on multiple entities, uh, and that's in Timor-Leste and, and Fiji, um, these two uh, studies led by MCRI. And finally, I'll, I'll describe studies that um, it's our uh, kind of collaboration with the Ministry of Health of endemic countries. So whereas where we are um, working with them to assess the impact of their NTD control programs on different entities, including trachoma, STH and schistosomiasis and, and integrated NTD control um, in Vanuatu. Okay, so I'll start with a large randomized control trial for STH control uh, called CODE STH, standing for Community Deworming Against STH. Uh, this work is by a large group of people, and uh, I should mention uh, specifically uh, the former trial coordinator, Naomi Clark, as well as Claire Dyer, um, Claire Dyer a current postdoc in our group, and, and also uh, Dean Guyen uh, in Vietnam from Thai Nguyen University, who is our project manager and has led the implementation of the trial. So why this trial? So as I may have mentioned, most um, STH control programs implement the school-based deworming of targeting school age children. However, uh, mathematical modeling and, and the pilot that I led previously suggests that expanding these delivery of, of uh, deworming medications to entire communities uh, will potentially lead to fewer reinfections in, in school age children because they will have the possibility of affecting transmission. And this is basically the, the, the hypothesis that we are aiming to test. And this is the first trial in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, this trial is, take, as is taking place um, in schools across uh, 13, all these 13 different districts of that Lac province uh, in the Central Highlands regions of, of Vietnam. It's just, just showing the distribution of, of the schools. Very quickly, just, uh, I guess, look at here, these shadowed uh, gray cells. So this is just a, a figure of the study design. So basically we have an intervention arm where we have 30, 32 schools and surrounding communities, meaning that you know, both children attending school and communities around those schools received the deworming medication. And then we have a control arm consisting of 32 schools where only the school age children received the medication and we didn't go to the, to the communities. And then we measured infection in school age children only. And this was done by PCR, by polymerase chain reaction methodology, so molecular techniques. And so we collected school samples at baseline just prior to the worming and then 12 months after the intervention. And we are currently finalizing data analysis. Okay, so this was quite a, a large uh, undertaking uh, in collaboration, as I said, with Thai Nguyen University and the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education, where we had uh, 13 teams of four people, uh, each led by Dean, plus supervisors and, and lab technicians, to a total of, of over 60 core staff, supported by almost um, uh, 300 village and hamlet uh, health workers. So we visited 113 hamlets, giving medications to almost um, nine, um, 90,000 people, and also gave tablets to around 21,000 children attending these uh, 64 schools. And we collected around 9,000 stool samples in each time point. And, and those samples were diagnosed by PCR at the University of Melbourne in Rebecca Straub. Rebecca Lab. Um, I'm just, 
I just wanted to quickly mention the work of these master students who is just concluding his, his uh, master's and he did a baseline risk factor analysis. So basically looked at the baseline uh, data set. So we have a 14% prevalence of hookworm in these children. And you can see this is busy, but it's basically the result of a multi, uh, multivariate analysis. And I hope you can see that uh, belonging to minority ethnic groups increase the risk of infection at baseline. And for instance, some wash variables like defecating on the ground also increase, increases the odds of, of infection. Uh, these are the preliminary results of our impact assessment. Uh, you may look at these p-values and see, so this is uh, looking at prevalence of Nicator americanus, the most prevalent STH species. You will see that there is uh, no significant difference in the prevalence in the control and intervention arm at the follow-up, which is not supporting our hypothesis um, that said that uh, giving medications to the entire communities would potentially lead to a benefit in children themselves. We are not being able to see that. Um, we are, however, seeing a borderline significantly greater reduction in infection intensity in the intervention arm compared to the control arm. So you can see here that um, the control arm um, has a higher proportion of children with high intensity infections than the, the control arm. So there is an impact or there seems to be an impact on morbidity uh, in children if you deworm entire communities. Okay, so next step, uh, we are finalizing the impact assessment analysis. Claire is doing that with and then one at, um, at the Kirby. And we have uh, Paul, a PhD student, looking at the cost effectiveness analysis of, of targeted versus mass deworming and, and Phoebe, looking at acceptability of the different deworming approaches and the health systems feasibility. Uh, we are also collaborating. So as I said, we are not being able to see a, a, an impact in prevalence reduction uh, as we expected, but I should point out that this was only a one year follow up. And because we are seeing an impact on intensity of infection, uh, it may be that if we use uh, mathematical um, modeling to predict the longer term impact, it may be that uh, there will be such an impact in prevalence if we look into the future long enough, except that we don't have enough funds to, to do additional follow up. So we'll have to resort to mathematical modeling. And Claire is also going to go to look closer to that uh, association that I mentioned in the beginning of, of um, uh, uh, you know, belonging to specific ethnic minorities and uh, odds and increased odds of, of infection. I now would like to turn to, to uh, the Solomon Islands and, and talk about the work of uh, Brendan Lee, a PhD student in our group. And, um, this is a study to, to assess the impact um, that ivermectin MDA for scabies control may have on STH. And this is uh, our team in, in the Solomons in action. Okay, so this uh, study is embedded within the RISE trial, standing for regimens of ivermectin of scabies, for scabies elimination. So this is a trial led by Professor Andrew Steer at MCRI. And it's comparing one versus two doses of ivermectin MDA on scabies. So I, I think I've mentioned that Lucia pioneered those uh, large scale MDA studies demonstrating that ivermectin MDA is an effective strategy for scabies control. But for most entities, the MDA programs only use one dose of a, give, a, give, a given medication. So basically this trial is trying to see if, if, if uh, one dose is also effective. We are adding an STH component to this trial to investigate uh, whether uh, one or two doses of ivermectin is also effective against any of the STH species that are present. So usually STH control is with albendazole, not with ivermectin, but ivermectin is efficacious against um, some of the STH species. So this trial takes place in the Western province of the Solomon Islands across 20 uh, villages. So we collected tools at baseline before MDA, and then again, um, 20 months after the, the intervention and samples are 
diagnosed again by PCR, PCR in Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Trolls lab. Brendan conducted uh, again a, a kind of a baseline analysis. You can see here that more than half of the population sampled is infected with at least one SDH. And there are uh, some factors associated with lower odds of infection. For instance, having uh, a latrine decreases the odds of infection with Nicator. Uh, we are currently waiting for um, the last results in terms of, so these samples were collected last year or this year, and we are uh, waiting for the diagnostics uh, by PCR and so that we can look at the impact of ivermectin MDA on STH. But uh, I should just add that uh, given that the Solomon Islands is about to roll out a national MDA program for scabies control, um, this study can already provide some, some light on whether that program may also impact STH. Uh, nevertheless, given the high presence of STH in the country, it is advisable that the Solomon Islands scale up uh, school deworming programs with albendazole as per WHO recommendations. And we have made that recommendation to the program, the NTD program. Okay, I will now turn to the second uh, research theme, which is on integrated control of NTDs. And I'll go through a few studies testing the impact of existing drug combinations on multiple NTDs. <clears throat> the first, sorry, is a study in collaboration with Josh Francis at Menzies, and this is also part of, of Brendan's PhD. So it takes place in uh, Timor-Leste, where we are assessing the impact of an uh, MDA campaign that has three drugs, ivermectin, DEC, and albendazole, and this MDA was implemented by the Minister of Health with the aim of eliminating LF as per WHO uh, guidelines. And we are testing whether this LF program may have an impact on other NTDs, including uh, scabies and STH. So we recruited children from six primary schools in three different municipalities of the country. And again, we collected stool samples and conducted skin examinations at baseline before MDA, and then 18 months after MDA. And we are now finalizing the statistical analysis that I'm about to show you. And I should have mentioned that uh, Salvador Amaral uh, was our project manager in the field. Okay, you will hopefully see very clearly he here that the prevalence of scabies with just one dose of ivermectin that was given in that LFMDA decreased um, scabies prevalence from almost 40 to 13 percent and and also that the prevalence of impetigo decreased from 12 to 2 percent on the other hand the prevalence of ascaris lumbricoides which was the, the the most prevalent sth in these um, schools in these children um, didn't significantly reduce its prevalence, or, uh, or I should say actually that when we went back 18 months after the distribution of albendazole, the infection, the, there, there, were, there was already reinfection. So um, it is known that prevalence uh, of STH, STH usually starts bouncing back due to reinfection because the eggs lay around in the, in the soil and they survive. So there is constant reinfection. And, and, and that's actually why STH control programs usually happen either annually or biannually. So this is not surprising. On the other hand, um, we, we did have a, a lower starting prevalence of tricuries, which is another STH. And um, it is known that uh, adding ivermectin to albendazole, which was the case in this MDA, is actually more efficacious uh, against tricuries. And we saw that in terms of effectiveness, it was still visible after 18 months. So that, that may be promising. So in conclusion, uh, one dose of ivermectin can uh, benefit scabies and in petago, and potentially with albendazole also be uh, visible in terms of, of effectiveness uh, or impact on, on infection with trichuria. And so these evidence 
may be used to support um, ivermectin um, donation. So basically, I didn't mention this, but most MDA programs rely on drug donation. So back in 2012, there was a commitment from pharmaceutical companies to donate um, these medications, which are relatively cheap to endemic countries through WHO. So countries just have not just, but kind of have to make that request for drugs, but they are capped. So for instance, ivermectin is used for, let's say, LF programs or onchocerciasis pro programs, but not for scabies. So there's um, you know, the need to, I guess, increase the, the pressure in terms of uh, the need um, or demonstrating that ivermectin is indeed effective against scabies and, and see if we can increase the amount of drugs donated to endemic countries to also tackle other diseases. Uh, and this is important in Timor, given that the burden of, of scabies is still um, quite high. Um, I will now mention just very briefly um, two studies that, as I mentioned, are led by Professor Andrew Steer at MCRI, but that have had the long-term contribution of, of Lucia Romani, who is now a senior research fellow uh, in our group. And one is Big Shift, and that's a large-scale before and after study. And again, these run along uh, um, a left a lymphatic filariasis and LF MDA campaign that again, like in Timor, used ivermectin, DC, and albendazole. And the aim of this study, uh, which was a large uh, scale study uh, looking at the population of, of over 100,000 people, is basically to assess whether that LFMDA would have an impact in uh, reducing community prevalence of scabies, but also uh, reducing hospitalizations and health center uh, visits. Uh, with uh, people um, having severe bacterial infections. So again, uh, in this case, uh, going looking at the impact of MDA on, an, on additional entities, but then also going beyond that and look at hospitalizations and clinical presentations. And this took place in, in Fiji. Okay, just kind of focus on this little right side of, of the table. Um, you may see here that there was a, a more modest uh, in, in impact on um, prevalence reduction on moderate and severe scabies, but still significant. Um, it was very uh, obvious in terms of prevalence reduction of impetigo that the, this um, ivermectin uh, distribution had. And you can also see here that there was a significant reduction in the incidence of, of hospitalizations and primary health presentations of skin and soft tissue infections under reduction of around 20% following MDA. So again, this shows the additional benefits of ivermectin MDA. The next study that I'll mention quickly um, is the FIT trial, so Fiji Integrated Therapy trial, um, also led by Andrew Steer with the contribution of Lucia. And this, uh, this is a, a three arm randomized control trial. And this trial initially, uh, I mean, this trial, the, 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 the uh, MDA trial with ivermectin DC and albendazole was. Um, part of a multi-center trial funded by the Gates Foundation. This was at a stage back in 2016 when it started that um, there was the need to demonstrate that adding iv ivermectin to the more common regimen of DC and albendazole was better for LF elimination. And um, you know the, there was this opportunity to actually extend the questions that the trial was trying to answer and assess whether these um, three different regimens were also having an impact on scabies. When, when I talk about different regimens for scabies, I'm again talking about two doses of ivermectin or one dose or just the standard treatment, which is um, identifying the, the people infested with scabies and then providing permethrin to them and their contacts. Um, I hope you can see here that uh, there was a significant reduction in all the three arms in scabies prevalence. Uh, and again, this uh, and, and these, uh, study wasn't able, uh, so it was a non-inferiority trial. And so um, uh, these studies suggest that one dose ivermectin is effective against scabies. 
and it wasn't able to detect a difference between the three, the three approaches. All of them had a significant impact. Uh, okay, I'm now entering the third theme of, of research that we do in, in the research in the NTD research group. And that's, um, so I'd like to show you some examples um, of our work supporting the Ministry of Health uh, of endemic countries to assess the impact of their NTD control programs. And that includes um, surveys to inform the need of um, um, an MDA program. So this is the case of Nauru, uh, where I work closely with Suchen Apadinue, uh, and this was funded by the Fred Howells Foundation. Okay, so basically why did we need to conduct this, this kind of more complicated trachoma survey? So usually you do a, a trachoma survey to, uh, using just clinical uh, investigation. So look at the, the um, TF, so trachomatous inflammation follicular, so clinical signs of infection. And then if it's above 5%, it means that the country should start MDA with azithromycin to control um, uh, trachoma. So there are some examples in other Pacific countries where that's called the Pacific Enigma, which basically means that people have clinical signs of trachoma, but they don't have scarring and there's no, I guess, evidence of kind of evolution to blindness. And, and also if you do PCR to detect infection in the eye, you actually cannot find bacteria. So there's something else causing that phenotype, that clinical presentation of trachoma. So alongside this national trachoma survey, we performed bacteriological and serological assessments of children to determine whether there was indeed trachoma or, or not. So we uh, sampled over 2,500 residents in 20 clusters across the entire island, which is not good, which is not big, if you know Nauru. Um, and we also asked 800, around 800 children to provide a nice swab for PCR to confirm the presence of bacteria and the dry blood spot um, for ELISA to detect antibodies that are a sign of previous exposure to that bacteria. Uh, okay, I hope you can see here that um, basically we found indeed that uh, there was a high level of clinical presentation of trachoma with 22% of children exhibiting TF. We found the presence of chlamydia um, in those children uh, at even higher levels at 34% and antibodies around 32% as well. And there was, there was a very nice profile. You can see that in, in pink, antibodies increase with age and uh, a clinical presentation also increases with age, but uh, the, the actual presence of, of chlamydia remains constant approximately. So these results indicated that there are high levels of chlamydia transmission among children, um, and that presents a risk of ocular damage. And, and based on this, the Ministry of Health conducted an azithromycin MDA back in 20, last year. We are uh, again kind of following the lead of previous studies in terms of, you know, if we do these MDA programs, it may be that they are impacting other diseases. And so you may know that um, azithromycin is also used to treat um, sexual transmitted infections. So, which is currently analyzing the data we, we, from a survey we, we, co we conducted as well. So uh, we were interested in, in, in taking this opportunity to see if these azithromycin MDA would also have benefits in reducing STIs in Aru, because there, there was evidence that some of these STIs are, are quite common. And so we looked at chlamydia, gonorrhea, and mycoplasma. So we conducted another survey um, recruiting adults this time and asking them to provide us with a, an urine sample um, to see if this MDA would have an impact on, uh, on urine uri, uri, genital chlamydia, sorry. Uh, and I'm just showing the results here for, for chlamydia um, in urine samples, so uh, an STI, as an STI. And we did indeed see a reduction in prevalence from uh, before the MDA to after the MDA. So showing that these NTD MDA programs uh, also have a benefit in other 
aspects and other, other infections. A similar study uh, or similar example of supporting the Ministry of Health in making decisions regarding their NTD control programs is this trachoma survey in Schweizel province in Solomon Islands. Uh, this was supported by, uh, again, the Fred Olds Foundation, and uh, it was led in the field by Oliver Sukana, who is uh, the, the lead of the NTD unit in the Solomons, uh, and Claire uh, Dyer is currently fin finalizing the, the analysis. This is a slightly different story. So again, um, Solomon Islands has been implementing MDA to eliminate trachoma as a, a public health problem. And they have conducted um, you know, MDA and then surveillance surveys to, uh, uh, that, that, that indicated that MDA could stop. So they stopped MDA and then they went back to do the surveillance surveys. In, and in one of these provinces in, in, in Schweizel, they saw that um, unexpectedly the prevalence of trachoma was higher than it should be. So it should be under 5%. Um, after MDA, but actually it had bounced back and it was over 10%. So because of that specific enigma that I've mentioned of children having the clinical presentation of trachoma, but not having actually um, bacteria in their eyes, we conducted a similar study um, where be besides uh, that uh, investigation of clinical presentation, we also looked at uh, infection and antibodies. So we eye swabs for PCR and blood spots for zero per per zero prevalence surveys. Um, this is now the results of um, those studies. So you can see here, just looking at the overall uh, column that 18% of those children exhibited signs of trachoma, but only 8.5% actually had um, uh, bacteria in their eyes and around 20% so similar to clinical presentation had um, antibodies. So showing that in the past they had been um, exposed to trachoma. So these findings mean that uh, in addition to chlamydia, there's in fact other pathogens causing TF, causing that clinical presentation, but nevertheless, there was the need of another round of MDA, given that this is above 5%. Um, I should also mention quickly the um, work that John Calder and Kylie Colling are conducting um, on trachoma in Australia and, and myself now more recently. So these are started back in 2010 where the Kirby hosts the, the National Trachoma Surveillance and Reporting Unit that basically analyzes uh, data on trachoma control activities in Australia and will manage the, the trachoma elimination dossier once uh, Australia is actually demonstrated that it has eliminated trachoma as a public health problem. So Australia is the only high income country that still has endemic uh, trachoma. And, and there's a, a control guidelines that are very similar to the international guidelines that include um, you know, MDA or, or treatment of communities or, or uh, contacts and, and, and households with um, when there's an, an infection. You can see here that over time, uh, trachoma prevalence in Australia has been declining and it's now reaching that 5% threshold. So soon, hopefully, Australia will be able to say that has eliminated trachoma as a public health problem. Um, of note is just to say that this is overall trends, but there's still a few communities in some of the jurisdictions that still have high levels of, of trachoma. Okay, so kind of racing to the end, I know we started slightly late. I think I'm still on time. Um, this is not the Pacific, this is Southern Africa, but I thought it would be interesting to also show another collaboration um, with the Ministry of Health in, uh, in Angola and, and the, another NGO, uh, the Mentor Initiative, um, particularly, so Sergio Lopes is the, the project manager there, uh, and Adam Bartlett, another postdoc in, in our group, is, is conducting that, that work. Um, so basically, um, kind of background, so Angola has endemic schistosomiasis and STH, um, so transmitted helminths, 
It has conducted in 2014 in these three provinces, one region side um, uh, a baseline survey to determine, the, to, to inform the beginning of a preventive chemotherapy program that has been ongoing. And we were uh, you know, uh, asked to, to work with Minister of Health and Mentor to design and implement the is a parasitological survey uh, where we used RDTs for schistosomiasis diagnostics and microscopy for STH and confirmation of, of um, schisto diagnostics and also some questionnaires to uh, look into risk factors. This was just showing, I wanted to show you this because again, this is a, a quite a large scale project. So we, or the teams in the field, this happened earlier this year, so 2021. Um, the teams visited more than 600 schools, recruiting more than 18,000 kids who did an RDT, and then in a subset, still uh, almost 7,000 kids were assessed for, for stools um, to look into um, STH. And, and a subset of those samples will also be looking at molecular techniques to basically compare uh, diagnostics. I don't have uh, final results I have a few results. We're still working on them, but basically, it's a bit disappointing to show that despite that ongoing preventive chemotherapy program, the presence of schistosomiasis is still quite high, 30%, which is not, you know, no difference between, um, or if anything, there was an increase in prevalence when comparing to the baseline. And the same thing for STH, not a huge impact of this preventive chemotherapy programs. I can speculate if you ask me about it, but you know it's probably linked to coverage. Um, you know these are school-based programs and, and many kids in Angola may not attend school. Uh, so you're leaving out quite a chunk of population. So there's ongoing transmission. So one recommendation could be to increase the regularity uh, at which these um, surveys take place. And now I'll just finish in two minutes, I promise. So just uh, kind of giving you some news of maybe a presentation I may be able to do in three years when we have more results. So these exciting, two exciting projects that we are just starting. So one is the PINE project, so Pacific Integrated NTD Elimination. And again, this um, is an initiative led uh, by the NGO Bridges to Development that received fund, funds from Takeda Pharmaceutical. And Bridges with, with the WHO is supporting the Ministry of Health of Vanuatu and PNG to implement um, two rounds of MDA to control or eliminate multiple entities in these countries. And the Kirby um, is very involved in the monitoring and evaluation of the MDA that is taking place in Vanuatu. And is actually, I hope you're not hearing my phone, but I, I get these notifications because the, the teams are in the field, so they are sending photos of lesions and, and issues in the field, so everything is happening. And um, so Claire and I have been working with Fasia Taleo in, in Vanuatu, who is a WHO officer, uh, and who is coordinating the, the implementation of these surveys as, as we speak, together with the MBA. So basically, <clears throat> we are conducting integrated uh, surveys looking at collecting stool samples for SCH and conducting clinical examinations for skin entities, as well as collecting dried blood spots for integrated seroSurveillance. And we hope by the end of this process to have almost 10,000 samples to, to look at the baseline uh, prevalence of these entities and then going back uh, in three years to look at the impact that um, these two rounds of MDA hopefully will have had. And linked to these, I just wanted to, to share that um, I've just recently been awarded a, a, an NHMRC partnership grant on integration of NTD programs. And this obviously is in collaboration with, with uh, a range of, of different investigators, our colleagues, um, but also working not only with PINE, uh, uh, but also with other uh, organizations working with Ministry of Health in endemic countries to implement MDA. So there's the World Scabies, Scabies Program, uh, and that is led by MCRI, uh, also with John Calder and Lucia Romani are also quite involved in this initiative. So the World Scabies Program is supporting the Solomon Islands 
in implementing uh, a SCAVIS MDA, so with ivermectin. And Fed Hollows um, is known in the region for providing support for trachoma elimination programs and, and also WHO for, for yours. So these are our aims of this five-year project. Um, so it's basically building on the MDA programs that the partners and the Ministry of Health are implementing. And we are coming in with some operational research interests in terms of improved diagnostics um, using this geostatistical uh, modeling to better uh, design surveys for identifying high burden areas. Um, also investigate health systems feasibility and acceptability of these interventions and conduct economic evaluations. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Susanna. Um, that was really great to hear about um, all the amazing work that you and your team have been doing on NTDs in, in uh, the region and, and beyond. Um, if we have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I did have a few questions. I wanted to first ask, um, obviously you've got some, uh, a lot of surveys with some um, really positive results from the, um, the drug administrations um, and then other ones where you've had a few challenges. And, and, and I was really impressed by the scale of the, the, the um, administrations and the, the surveys that you've been doing. Um, I wanted to ask how COVID um, has affected um, the projects in, in all these amazing remote communities. Um, how has it inhibited the work and um, is this work continuing on using your um, partners on the ground in those countries? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think your question has two, two questions, I guess. One is the impact of COVID on on the actual NTD control programs. And, and, and that's well documented. Actually, I didn't mention that, that study, but Claire is also looking into that from more uh, an implement, implementation perspective. So basically when COVID started, so these are old interventions that require health staff to go to communities or to schools. And that was basically stopped. Um, and WHO recommended that to be stopped. But then, and so then there, there's a, a whole range of uh, references already showing the impact that it has on on these diseases because as i said you know you have to go back every year to, to give drugs and to some of them like parasite intestinal parasites you know if you skip a year okay, it's bad but it's not you know that bad for other diseases like lf or diseases where you're trying to reach elimination of transmission obviously it kind of sets you back by a lot um mm -hmm. And so, so there are papers looking into, into it. Um, I mean, there's some, I guess, positive notes because, and that's also what we are looking at in terms of the fact that a lot of the, as you know, prevention for COVID um, is around hygiene, washing your hands, um, you know, and, and so that may have actually had a trickle down effect on, on some of the NTDs, but, you know, it's not clear either. And, and the programs now have resumed their MDA programs and, and we are looking into whether there's some lessons learned or, uh, or adaptations that actually can lead to any you know, success stories in terms of NTD control. In terms of the research, it was equally bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was very, very difficult. I mean, I, I did you know, some of the studies you may have noticed, one was 20 months, another 18 months. It wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be 12 months. You know, usually that's kind of the, the, the regular interval of MDA. So we had to put things on hold, um, but I have to say that actually I was generally very lucky. Um, I mean, I think one of one of one one justification is because yeah, I was lucky, <laughs> uh, because the countries where I work at in like Vietnam, I went there in February or March, and the same thing as Solomon, just like the week before the border closed. So I was quite lucky um, in a way, um, but also. No, it wasn't only luck. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for a while now and, um, you know, and I've lived and worked in, in the fields for a long time. And, and basically I, I do value the importance of having close collaborations and, and this wouldn't have been possible if those collaborations didn't exist in such, you know, in such strength. So um, it also taught us that obviously I miss going to the field and you know my students and postdocs all miss going to the field because that's one of our 
I guess, major drivers in terms of doing this kind of research is the opportunity to, to engage directly with these communities and with, with these collaborators. But, you know, we need to be humble as well and recognize that we can do things other way remotely if there are a certain, you know, set of conditions in terms of those collaborations. But, you know, we've been doing a lot of Zoom trainings and, and remote teaching and learning, but it's not ideal, but some things we are we are being able to move things along. Yeah, but I can't wait for the border to <laughs> fully open and get back there. <laughs> a lot of us feel the same, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. We've only got a couple of minutes. Um, uh, I I can't see another question. I, I did want to ask um, other other environmental factors and and um, with these projects. Um, is, is there also an environmental factor approach that can be taken and considered in the study? I'm, I'm wondering about, um, you know, I, I know ivermectin has been in the news a lot for, for all the wrong reasons um, in terms of the COVID situation. Um, but um, oh, yeah, I was kind of wondering if, if there'd been shortages of ivermectin, but also then on, uh, in terms of the use of some of these things, um, if it's uh, if it's also possible to um, consider, you know, is it, is it is it passed on by animals, um, and can animals be also um, inoculated um, to prevent sort of some of these diseases being passed on? Um, those sort of environmental factors that might be an influence. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. So that's again a lot of questions. I'll try to be yeah, brief, sorry. which is not my strength. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so ivermectin, yes. For instance, in Vanuatu, you know, like uh, Brazil makes cyber kind of generic ivermectin for instance and and so there are countries that manufacture ivermectin but then blocked export of ivermectin so actually we had to get well the who had to get ivermectin from other providers to be able to go ahead with mda in, in vanuatu for instance uh so that is an issue in terms of environmental variables for sure uh both environmental like in climate like for instance sth soil pH uh, and temperature and humidity have, I mean, you cannot change the weather. Actually, you can change the weather, but only if you, you know, if you go for cold and that's not great into that discussion. But anyway, assuming you cannot change the climate, um, you know, there's a few, not a lot of things that you can do, but for instance, you can manipulate soil pH, for instance, and that could be, you know, a, a line of research. But then there's wash factors, so water access and hygiene. So that, that is environmental in a way, in terms of how humans lead, deal with, with their feces and you know, if they have access to sanitation, but access to water and, and are able to have you know, good hygiene. And then in terms of animals, the same. So for STH, some STH species are zoonotic. And actually these campaigns that we do in humans for STH, veterinarian parasitology veterinaries and and kind of do the same so many countries also have, not a lot but in high income countries there are programs to uh, you know deworm cattle and and you know other countries do that to dogs because that there's another you know dogs can also be a reservoir so yes so there is uh, we don't do that a lot. We do that a little bit, but yes, One Health is a concept that is quite popular in, in NTDs because some of these diseases are indeed zoonotic and we can talk about human interventions, but we need to then look at the animal side as well. All right, great. Thank you for that. Um, and my, sorry about my multi-pronged questions. <laughs> so, okay. thanks, thanks for the opportunity. I enjoy talking about this, so not a problem. Uh, that's great. Well, thank you. We've we've perfectly timed it to an hour, um, and um, we will. Um, this has been recorded, so we will post it on the IGD website. So uh, thanks again, Susanna, and um, and your and thanks also to your team for that excellent research. Um, and we look forward to hearing more. We hope to have you in a couple of years when you've been able to get back in the field. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.